one leg in the Center for Anthropological Research, and that is where my colleague Matt is from. I'm going to introduce the main speaker, who is from WITS very soon. I just want to thank you all for coming. It's a very cold evening, and that often scares Joburgers back into their homes. We're not used to cold. And I looked at my weather book yesterday. I made my first fire last year on the 8th of April. And last night, we could have made a fire. So it's actually not very different from last year. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy the talk. We actually planned it for last year, but with all the upheavals, we didn't have an opportunity to go forward with it because we wanted to have the talk when everything was still very hot. But Marina, I'm really happy to have you here because I think, um, you know, the big news has died down a little bit and I'm sure you guys know a lot more. You're going to tell us about it. So could I introduce the, the speakers and the, uh, the Marina, who's the main speaker, and Matt, who is the respondent. So Marina is originally from Calgary in Canada. She's now a postdoctoral research fellow at WITS under Professor Lee Berger. In October 2013, she responded to a message from Prof Berger. He put it out on Facebook, calling for excavators, excavators for a unique expedition in the cradle of humankind. They wanted to collect hominin remains in a cave deep underground. You probably know the whole story. They wanted to have females that is um, thin and can go through all the crevices. The catch was that all the applicants had to be experienced enough in caving and climbing to negotiate the difficult route and small enough to fit through several tiny squeezes along the way. Marina was chosen along with five other women for a job. A month later, they discovered 1,350 fossil specimens of a new hominin species, Homo naledi. Another week of excavation in March 2014 yielded more material, and now they have 1,550 specimens. The announcement and the academic papers of this remarkable discovery was made last year in September. A lot of media attention. The project is featured in the October issue of National Geographic magazine and was the subject of a PBS Nova special that was aired in North America last year. Marina did her Master's of Arts and PhD in Biological Anthropology at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia in Canada. You know, you don't make the mistake I made by saying, oh, which university in the States? And you know, Canadians do not like to have us confuse their accents with the people from the South. During her academic journey, Marina excavated in southern Siberia, in Alaska, and she also conducted forensic anthropological casework for the British Columbia Coroner Services and was a visiting scientist for the New York Medical Examiner's Office. Now, Matt, Matt has also has an accent, but that is indeed a true accent from America. Matt, Karyana graduated from UCLA in Los Angeles in California with a bachelor's in cultural anthropology. He then attended Manchester University in England for his master's, which focused on cognitive archaeology in 2007. He recently graduated from Wits University in 2015 with a PhD in archaeology specializing in earlier Stone Age research. Is affiliated with excavations and ongoing research at the Town World Heritage Site, the Dreamwollen or Drimmelen fossil site in the cradle, and the Amanzi Springs Acheulean site. Matt is currently affiliated with the Center for Anthropological Research here at UJ. Um, if everything goes well, the paperwork seems to be in. We don't know if it's a yes or a no, but um, hopefully in the next month, um, actually from the 1st of May, we'll be a postdoctoral fellow here at UJ at the Centre. Welcome, you two. And um, you. colleagues, I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me okay? Um, it is a real pleasure to be here, and I'm sorry that... Um, I didn't 
I wasn't able to come in October last year when everything was, was really hot, but hopefully this will still be of interest to everyone. So um, I was indeed very privileged to be part of the team that recovered Homo Naledi last year. And basically, I just want to share that experience with you today and a little bit about the science of what we've discovered since then. So all of this actually started back in uh, 2013 when two sport cavers, Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker, were encouraged by an ex-student of Lee Berger's to start looking in the caves when they were doing their, their recreational trips and just keeping an eye out for material that, that might be of interest to paleoanthropologists. Oh, and I'm losing sound again. Um, on a Friday night, actually, the two of them were exploring a cave called Rising Star near Krugersdorp. And the, it's a very well-known system. They, it's been used by recreational cavers for many years and has been mapped quite thoroughly. But at the time, Rick and Steve were looking in an area that was off the map. And there are a number of very tight squeezes towards the back end of the system that they were exploring. And at one point, Steve dropped into a narrow fissure to get out of Rick's way and realized that the fissure actually continued down. In fact, all the way down about 12 meters. So the two of them started working their way down this crack and ended up in a small chamber. They went through another narrow hallway and found another chamber. And it was in this second chamber that they found some bones. And they thought, well, gee, this looks like what we've been told to keep an eye out for. Let's take some photos. Unfortunately, at that point, their camera died. So they actually went back a week later on a second trip to squeeze down again and look for this material. And they actually took photographs of these bones in the chamber and went to Pedro and said, is this the kind of thing you think Lee is looking for? And Pedro took one look at the pictures and said, yes, I think that's true. And off they went to Lee. Now, as many of you probably actually already know, Lee is a paleoanthropologist at Witts University and also a National Geographic Explorer in residence. He's known particularly for a spectacular fossil find in 2008, Australopithecus sediba, that was also found in the cradle of humankind. But at the time, it was an exceedingly important find and one of the most complete sets of hominid fossil material that had been then known. So Lee looked at these photographs and almost instantly recognized that they were and, and that they were of great interest. So he made a phone call. First, actually, to Terry Garcia, who's the chief exploration officer at National Geographic. And Lee said to Terry, look, I've, I've found something that I think is exceedingly important, but I need some assistance with this. You know, if, you, if you're ever going to trust me, trust me now, which really is explorer speak for, can I have some money? And Terry Garcia said, well, Lee, you know, do what you need to do, which is actually funder speak for go for it. Then at this point, Lee had to figure out how he was actually going to get this material out of the cave. The cavers had told him that it was a very difficult area to get to, and he didn't know how he was going to actually get this material out. So he did what any good researcher would do. He put an ad on Facebook. So this ad actually, as you can see, um, called for some very specific individuals for a very specific expedition. And I didn't actually see this ad. My supervisor at the university at the time, when I was fi finishing my PhD, sent me this ad and said, oh, you know, I knew you were a climber. I don't suppose you have caving experience. And of course, the ad sounded very mysterious and a little bit dangerous. And so, of course, I was interested. One of the reasons I was interested, actually, is that I had grown up in centr central southern Alberta, climbing and caving in the Rocky Mountains. So I was very used to confined spaces and difficult areas. So I was, I was quite happy with that part of it. But the other reason was that as part of my archaeology and anthropology training, I had had excavation experience in real, relatively extreme environments. So I had done a field season in Siberia, uh, doing mortuary archaeology and that's again a, a pretty extreme environment even in the summer when we were excavating there. I'd also done a season in Alaska at the northern tip of Alaska in a place called Barrow which is about as far north as you can get before you fall off the continent and it was the first time actually that I excavated under armed guard not for people but for the polar bears. 
So I had these, this pretty good set of skills that I thought would be handy for this expedition, and so I thought I would give it a shot. As it turned out, 60 other people thought they also had the right skill set for this expedition. But after a number losing my sound. After a number of Skype interviews, Lee chose six of us, not because we were women, we just happened to be women, all of us, but there were four Americans, one Australian and myself, a Canadian. All women as it turns out, but all also all in, in the early stages of careers in anthropology or archaeology. And within a month actually of Lee's announcement, we were all in South Africa building a 60-person camp, enlisting the help of numerous volunteers, scientists, um, food orienting people, caterers, camp managers, all that kind of thing, running kilometers of power cables into the cave, setting up multiple communication stations, cameras, safety equipment, checking all of that equipment and learning what we were about to do, which was to go into this cave and collect this material. As it turns out, the cave was very difficult and quite remote to get into. The cavers had not underestimated how difficult this was. So the fossil chamber itself is about 200 meters away from the nearest outside entrance and about 25 or 30 meters underground. But to get there, you have to navigate a couple of very narrow hallways where you have to sort of move sideways through these spaces. Then there are two climbs, one of about four meters that we have a ladder at, and then there's another open chamber. But then you go through what we call the Superman crawl, which is a three meter tunnel, which is called the Superman crawl because you literally have to put one arm above your head, one arm pinned to your side, you're lying on your stomach, pushing just with your toes to get through this space. So it's definitely not for everyone. And then actually that's the easy part, um, the next area that we're faced with is a space called the Dragon's Back, which is actually an eight meter high rock ridge that's about 25 centimeters wide. And you literally are walking along this ridge and there's a six meter drop on one side and an eight meter drop on the other. So you get up to the top of that ridge, you go through another very short tunnel, and then you are presented with what we call the chute, which is this 12 meter deep crack that Rick and Steve initially found the went down to to find the material and that space is at the most 45 centimeters wide but it narrows down to an 18 centimeter pinch point that you have to get through so you're literally moving down just feeling with your hands and feet there's not enough room to bend your head down to see where you're going your head is just to one side so it's just a feel all the way down and a feel all the way up so it's um not an easy space to get to and this is the result <laughs> so this is what we looked like most days when we were uh, moving in and out of these spaces but I think all of us really felt that that it was worth it in the end I was actually one of the first I was the first scientist into the chamber and we started excavating and I think initially we all thought that we were just going in after a single skeleton probably something like Paranthropus or an Oscillopithecine that was already known in the area, but we just really thought we were going after this one skeleton. But as I moved into that space for the first time, I really realized that we were dealing with something quite different. Everywhere that I shone my headlamp, I could see flashes of bone. It was obvious that there was much more material there than we had originally realized. So our first task actually was collect all the material that was on the surface. So this was a matter of tagging every piece of bone that we saw that was just lying on the ground, and then very carefully collecting it, wrapping it in bubble wrap, wrapping it again in a little plastic container, and having either one of us or one of the cavers take it out to the surface. And we recovered some 350 fragments in that first initial surface collection. We then got down to the actual excavating. We worked in pairs or sometimes threes, usually for five to seven hours a day. And this is literally on our hands and knees because where the vast majority of the material was, there's actually a rock overhang that you can't stand up in. So we were literally on our hands and knees excavating with toothpicks and tiny brushes for five to seven hours a day, usually in teams of two to three. 
One thing to note here is that unlike most of the other sites in South Africa, this material was in soft sediments. It's not in the hard breccia, the rock that you see with things like Australopithecus sediba or some of these other sites. So the excavation was really much more like a traditional archaeological excavation than it was like the paleontological ones that we see normally. And so we managed to collect, as with the surface material, once this material was excavated, we actually, again, documented it, wrapped it up in these special containers and brought them to the surface. In fact, as you can see in this one picture, we had to be a little bit creative in how we brought some of the material up with the one skull fragment because it was so delicate and we wanted to maintain its structural integrity. We actually stole a cereal bowl out of the canteen and used it to support the skull as we brought it up to the surface. Once the material was actually up on the surface, it went to what we called the science tent. And it was here that it got its initial photographs, it was properly accessioned, it got repackaged and protected for transport back to Witz eventually. And it was a real joke around the camp initially that, you know, after the first or second day, we were actually going to need another safe. And then we were going to need another safe. And material just kept coming and coming and coming. So that round of excavation lasted about three weeks and brought up, as Taya said, 1,500 fragments from that first round of excavation, a truly astonishing amount of material. We then did a second round of excavation in March 2014 with a smaller crew, what I like to call our skeleton crew, um, of just two excavators and some surface assistants and a couple of cavers. After that, we actually brought up another 300 fragments from that second round of excavation. So again, just an incredible amount of material in a very, very short period of time. And then the material from these two excavations was analyzed in May 2014. As in, sorry, I'm ridiculous little <coughs> sound things. Um, as part of the, an international workshop of 40 scientists, both senior established scientists and early career scientists. I can't really call myself a young scientist at this point, but I am early in my career. So it was a bringing together of both very experienced mentors and younger academics to bring all these great minds together to analyze this material. It's a really incredible workshop, and that resulted in, in the scientific announcement that was made in September last year, as many of you probably knew, to great fanfare and a lot of media attention. And that was a really exciting time, but now I want to shift and we'll actually look at what, was, what made this find so newsworthy. So first of all, as I mentioned, the volume of material is truly astounding. So we now have somewhere in the range of 1,700 numbered specimens from this one site. And it's the largest single assemblage in, of hominid fossil material in Africa and one of the largest in the world. It's an incredible amount of material. And in fact, this photograph doesn't even do it justice. This shows only about a third of the material that we've brought up. So it's a really fantastic assemblage of material. The quality of the material is also truly outstanding. As I mentioned, we were excavating in softer sediments rather than in, in hard rock, and that actually allowed or somehow managed to, to maintain the bones in a, in a way that is very much like modern bone. The feel and the texture of them is, is very similar to modern bone. Unlike many of the fossil material from Sidiba, from Malapa, or from Sturkfontein, that actually are fully mineralized and feel like rock rather than like bone. So the preservation of this material is really, really fantastic. We also have an incredible demographic profile from this volume of material. So at the moment, we have a minimum number of individuals of 15, ranging in age from very young infants all the way to older adults. Again, very, very uncommon in paleoanthropological context, even in archaeological context, to get that breadth of a population is, is very uncommon. And it is, we think, a very closely related population. The, the skeletal structures of each of these individuals is very, very similar. So it looks very much like a, a very um, homogenous population. And that's really interesting as well. And we have some of the most complete elements ever found in the hominin fossil record. For example, this foot is only missing a couple of bones, and it's actually one of five partial feet that we have in the assemblage. 
We also have probably now the most complete hand in the fossil record. Um, Sediba, up until Rising Star, Sediba was one of the most complete, and I think we've usurped that now because this hand actually found in articulation is only missing one pea-sized bone in the wrist, and it's one of seven others that we've got in this assemblage. So it really is incredible the kinds of small, very delicate bones that we've been able to recover from this. And in fact, we've even got some incredibly rare bones. These are actually two tiny ear ossicles. So you have th three very small little bones in your ear. These are two of them from two different individuals. We know that because they're both right and you don't have two of those in one side. Um, but these, these bones are very, very rarely found in the fossil record. In fact, so rare that these two bones have doubled the sample size of these particular elements in the fossil record. There were only two others ever found before this, and we have just doubled that sample size. So that's really exciting. Because we have almost every element uh, represented in this collection, we have a really good idea of what Homo naledi looked like. Overall, it demonstrates a real mosaic of features, and uh, we can talk about the anatomy later, but um, basically what that means is that there are some parts of its anatomy that are much more like later Homo or even modern humans, whereas some parts of the anatomy are very much more primitive, much more like extant apes or even some of the other Australopithecines in other parts of Africa. So it's, it's a very uncommon and unexpected set of features that we get in this. And as a result, we actually can say pretty definitively, also because we have both the skull anatomy and the lower body anatomy, that this is for sure a new species and not something that, that we have just sort of cobbled together from, from other species. So again, it's a very exciting collection to have because we have so many individuals, we have so many bones, and we can actually say with some, some reasonable certainty what this population looked like. Now, one of the big questions, obviously, is where does Naledi fit into the human family? And that's a question that we actually, ha excuse me, haven't actually answered yet. That's something for ongoing research. At this point, we're not saying that it's on the human family line. It's obviously within our family, but whether it's a direct line or just a distant cousin, we'll take some more research. But I think one of the things that this does demonstrate is that some of the things we assumed we knew before about human evolution and our own origins need to be rethought. So what this suggests is that there was a species around that we could never have predicted. No one would have thought that we would get this kind of anatomy in a single population, never mind this consistent anatomy over a single population. So it really is very interesting to think about, you know, the complexity and realize that the human family tree, unlike perhaps what we thought of in the past as this very linear progression from Australopithecines to us actually needs to be complicated quite a bit more. And in fact, I think for me, one of the things that this suggests in particular is that our human, our, our interpretation of human evolution might not even be like a tree at all, or even a bush as we were starting to think about it not too long ago, but that in fact it may be more like a glacier lake or a delta. Coming from Canada, the Glacier Lake works very well for me, but perhaps here the Okavango Delta would be a better analogy. But literally what we might be looking at are multiple streams coming down into a lake. Some of these streams drift off and dry out. Some of them actually may come back into each other in that braided fashion and, and re connect with a, a stream as it continues down. And eventually what we end up with is that big pool of what is now seven billion of us at the bottom. So it's one of those things that it's, it's really exciting to think about. We don't really know what we thought we knew before this. And so instead of that being a problem, I actually think that's really exciting and it's an awesome time to be in this, in this discipline. But if all of that wasn't enough, there was actually another support in the Dinaletti chamber. Among the 15 or 1700 now fragments that we recovered from that site, and I think one of the things people don't really realize, it's kind of hard to explain unless you're in front of somebody, is that those 1700 fragments, 300 were collected from the surface, but the rest were collected from an excavation unit 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters by 20 centimeters deep. 
that's smaller than the size of this table. That's really difficult to get your head around when you realize the density that that implies. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But the other thing, in among all of that material, other than a handful of modern bird bones on the surface and some unassociated rodent material, there's not a single specimen in those 1700 that is not identifiably hominid. That is unprecedented. That just does not happen. And in particular, that doesn't happen outside of deliberate acts by modern humans up until this point. And so even though this took us quite a bit of time to come to the realization of, we, we had to come to the working hypothesis that Homo naledi may actually have been deliberately disposing of their dead in this space. And we know that that's a, a challenging concept for people. We know it's going to be something that will be deba debated for some time. But at this point, we don't have any other way of explaining the evidence that we've got. And we can go through that um, shortly as well. And again, for me, a lot of this comes down to, you know, what, what does this say about both this particular group? They are not human. We wouldn't recognize them if they got on the bus as being within our own group. So they, this is not a human population. But it's possible that this non-human population was doing something that we thought only humans did, which is to dispose of their dead. And that, I think, is something really interesting. We now know from lots of other research that non-human animals do do some of the things we do. We have learned that we're not the only ones that make tools. We have learned we're not the only ones that have culture to a certain extent. We're not the only ones who communicate. There are all these areas in which we once thought that humans were alone, that we have learned over and over again that we are maybe just on one end of a spectrum rather than actually isolated. And I think this may be one of those cases as well. And again, that's fodder for lots of new research, lots of new questions. And rather than being you know, a, a problem, I see it as an opportunity to explore those ideas and, and think about what that means. Now, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention about this find, and that is about the publication of the material. If any of you were following the, the announcement last September, we actually made the announcement in conjunction with the release of the scientific papers in an open access journal called eLife. And at the time, people were very curious as to why we chose an online access journal rather than something big like nature or science. And that was also, again, for very, very specific reasons. This material is not just South African heritage, it's world heritage. It's about all of us. And we wanted to make sure that anyone who was interested had access to that material. So it was very important for us to allow all the members of the public, if you are interested, you can go online, you can download the papers, you can engage with the science yourself. Another thing that we did to promote that is we actually scanned all of the fossils and put the shape files online on a website called Morph Morphosource, which is held by Duke University. So anyone with a 3D printer or access to a 3D printer can download models of the cast casts or models of the fossils themselves and look at that material for themselves. So again, something that we really want to promote is, you know, if, if you don't want to know about this, fine, that's your choice. If you do want to engage with the science and you want to, to read about it yourself, you may. And, and that was really important for us. And for me personally, um, after the launch, I really realized that I think people fear what they don't understand. And unless the public can engage directly with the kind of science that we're doing and science generally, it's very difficult to communicate that and very difficult to support it in terms of universities or in terms of of you know, um, popular culture or just in terms of, of policy. And I think that's something that as a university is very important to understand is that if we don't communicate our science or our, even if you're not in the sciences, communicate what you do to people, they don't, won't understand it and they won't support it. So in the end, um, whether our origins began in Eastern Africa or Southern Africa, one of the things that, that I, take a lot of enjoyment in is, is this feeling that in the end we are all Africans and that it's incredibly exciting that a find like this is being you know, worked on here. 
um, and this material is staying here and being promoted here. It's a South African university. We have lots of, of South African colleagues. I'm a foreigner working on this material, but it's been an awesome pleasure to, to work with so many South African colleagues and encourage people to come from overseas to South Africa to do the research rather than the old system where people would come and take the material away. So I think that's something to be very, very proud of, that this work is happening here and in South Africa and at a local university by so many South African researchers. So I hope this find and, and this talk actually encourages South Africans and people all over the world to actually participate and engage with the science and research and discovery. And there's so much more to do and learn about this material. And in fact, we're making new discoveries every day. So watch this space. Um, but it's, it's a really ex exciting time to be in this discipline. And I hope that you will join us along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. I'm going to ask Matt to respond in about 10, 15 minutes, and then we will open up for the discussion, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. All right. Okay, Matt. Uh, Marina, your contribution to uh, this um, study is, is really commendable. Um, I've always been excited about doing research in South Africa and to promote South Africa as a place to find human origins. Certainly take some of the center off uh, the focus of East Africa, which is traditionally, uh, you know, thought to house the oldest and the best. And now, uh, you know, we're finally starting to rival that and promote South Africa as a place for paleoanthropology to really grow as well as archaeology and all the related fields. So it, it really is commendable the type of work that you're trying to do. Uh, also in promoting, you know, this open access uh, forum, I think, is, is where the field needs to go. Um, now, just uh, a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned that when you first entered the cave that you weren't expecting to find this sort of new species. You thought maybe Australopithecus paranthropus, um, which is perfectly acceptable thinking about these cave sites where those types of, of uh, hominid species are most found. So when did that aha moment happen where you figured out this is a new species and I'm wondering if you can maybe just comment a little bit on how that process actually went. Yeah, for sure, let me see if I can make sure that I'm on again. Am I? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, that's an awesome question actually, and I've never had that question before. So I've, I've done a lot of these talks now, and um, one tends to get the same questions over and over again, so it's fantastic when there's a new one around. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I think it was probably either the second or third day that we realized that we were dealing with more than one individual. Um, initially, we actually thought, you know, that it was just a single skeleton because, you know, obviously Lee had only seen a smattering of pictures. Um, and so, you know, no one really expects to find 15 individuals in a, you know, in a tiny space. But it was really probably the second or third day that we realized we were dealing with more than one individual. And that was because we came up with two right femurs. So, like the, the ear ossicles, you don't normally get a three-legged person, so we knew it was another one. Um, as far as the actual species goes, I think that was also um, reasonably early in the process, probably within the first two weeks, partly because we ended up bringing up quite a lot of dental material, and dental material, for those of you who, who might be following this kind of thing, is, is very diagnostic often of, of a species. Cranial material generally, the skull is usually what paleoanthropologists use to identify species because the, post, the rest of the body doesn't really look necessarily all that different depending on, on what you're looking at. And often you only have a scrap of one or the other, you don't have both. So um, with our team of senior scientists, I think it every night we would actually talk over the material and we would look over, the, I mean, literally, we would do our, our five or six hour shifts and go straight to the science tent to then look at the material as if we hadn't had enough of it already that day. But, you know, it, it was very exciting. And so we would go over the material once it had been cleaned and really talk it over as, as a group. And it, I think it happened very organically, but very obviously. We had all this cranial material, we had all this post-cranial material, it was obvious that, you know, of the five or seven femur 
tests that we had, they all looked the same. We weren't just dealing with, you know, a pathological individual or a, a strange group. So yeah, it happened pretty quickly. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and I, I mean, I, I know that these things are still under study. Geez, I'm really loud. Um, in any case, um, is there any sort of uh, phylogenetic um, or, or thought about phylogenetics at the current time? I mean, is it most of the time, you know, the, the typical process is you find, okay, this creature has affinities more so with Homo habilis or Homo erectus and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I know you may not be able to, to speak on that directly, but is there some thinking in that line that might suggest here is where Homo naledi does fit in? Yeah. Um, sorry, this wretched thing. These things really are challenging. Um, you're either too loud or too soft or something. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of, and I'm sure this will be one of those burning questions in the audience, do we have a date? No, not yet. Um, but we are getting very, very, very close to, to a date on this material. Um, so just as a, as a preface to that, we don't have a date. And one of the reasons that we didn't push for a date right away um, was this, this concept that I think in the past, a lot of paleoanthropology has made too many assumptions about the relationships when they have the time frame. So what often happens is you say, okay, this, this creature is 2.5 million years old, therefore must be Australopithecine. And that's, that's happened over and over and over again. Essentially, it happened with Homo floresiensis, and some of you may have heard the news just recently that, that Homo floresiensis has been redated. But one of the challenges for the people that found Homo floresiensis was that it was very modern, and our little paleoanthropology brains can't compute something that looked very archaic, but that was in a very modern time period. So they put it in Homo, in our genus even though lots of its features don't look like Homo. And in many ways, Naledi also has this problem. Many of its features are very much like features in our own genus. Lots of the cranial um, features, if you just look at the shape, look very much like Homo, except that, as I probably didn't mention, we have this tiny little brain that then goes, oops, maybe that's further back. Some of the other anatomy, the postcranial anatomy, also looks very archaic. So we wanted to actually look at that anatomy without the bias of a date and just say, okay, what is it that we're looking at here and how does it fit? So kind of like a coelacanth or a nautilus, it is possible for species to look very archaic but last into a very modern period. So we didn't want to make the assumption based on its morphology that it was at a specific point. So long answer to a question. Um, we have done phylogenetic analyses and we are doing more of those. If you just look at the anatomy, you would put Naledi somewhere very basal at the base of our, human, of our tree, somewhere at the cusp between Australopithecines and Homo. The problem is what we're learning from material like this is that there isn't just one node. There's probably a bunch. And like what has happened in many other biological systems, there was probably a fluorescence of these kinds of species, an adaptive radiation, if you will, that there was an explosion of these things. And there might have been you know, five or six different bipedal hominids wandering around. Sometimes they may have even temporarily overlapped. But until we have more material to look at, we can't make those those sure. Um, inferences yet. Sure. Okay. Um, no, fantastic. Um, also, uh, it, you've described this pathway to get into the Den the Denaledi chamber, which sounds, I think, horrifying to a lot of people. Everyone. Yeah, who who don't who don't come from this background. Um, you know, and so the the thought comes up that Homo naledi must have had probably had some, you know, very adept climbing adapt, uh, adaptabilities. And is there anything morphologically that might speak to that? Curvature of hands, feet, something like this. I was going to say you've been reading the papers. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, let's see. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, actually. Um, Matt has led nicely into a question. Yes. Um, one of the things that Homo naledi has that is very distinct are 
is a wrist that looks very much like a modern human. So that we would say, you know, very much more homo. Some of the rest of the hand also looks very human-like, but the fingers are actually incredibly curved, almost more curved than, than some of the early osteopathocenes that we've seen. It also has an incredibly strong thumb bone. So this first metacarpal is actually unique to Naledi. It has a, a shape that is its own thing and actually suggests to us that that grip strength was extremely strong and that this species was obviously bipedal. We know that from the lower anatomy, but that they were doing something very strong with their hands. So at this point, we don't have any other evidence to say what that might have been, but if you put the, the caving aspect with it, it's not a bad um, idea to say that they were doing something very, maybe not arboreal, but rather cave-oriented as opposed to tree-oriented. Yeah. Right. Okay, my last question for you, um, which may be something you can only touch upon, how much material do you think is still in the Dinaledi chamber, and is there any other deposits that might come out of, of the Rising Star cave system we can look forward to? Also, excellent question. Um, we have excavated not quite a tenth of the surface of the floor of the Dinaledi chamber. And there is every indication that there is quite a bit more material, that we have barely scratched the surface of that particular chamber. Also, yes, we have made other discoveries. <laughs> and that's where I can stop. Right. Yes. But um, no, we, um, we are making new discoveries and we will let you know as soon as we do. I'm still excavating. Let's just put it that way. Thanks, Marina, and thanks, Matt. I'm going to stand up for this. Um, it's question time. Can I abuse my privilege to quickly ask you a question? You know what doesn't make sense to me is why climbing hands or not, why would they go through that effort dragging, schlepping dead individuals? Was there not another opening? Yeah, I think it's entirely possible that there was another opening somewhere within the system. However, what we do know for pretty good certainty is that past a certain point, there wasn't another way to get into that chamber other than the way that we currently use. Now, I know that that is difficult. I complain about carrying a backpack in there, never mind a dead relative. So I understand that that's a challenge you know, that we have to deal with. But from both the geology and the sedimentology that we've done, we know that basically past that horrific dragon's back that I described to you, there is no other way into the Dinaledi chamber, and there hasn't been another way into the Dinaledi chamber. And part of that is evidenced by the fact that we don't have any other species in that space. So at no point in the past did a porcupine, a hyena, a baboon, no species that often inhabit caves anyway that we find in Further spaces, I mean, we, we find remnants of modern baboons quite deep into the cave because they've gotten lost, but at no point in the depositional history of the Naledi chamber did another animal get in there other than, you know, some random mouse teeth and six bird bones. So for us, that's, that's the, one of the real barriers is that whatever other explanation we are confronted with has to explain how you get 15 individuals of a single population into a tiny space to the exclusion of every other similarly sized species. So while there may be another entrance somewhere in the system, at a certain point that system was closed. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm going to take, unless the questions are very complicated, I'm going to take three questions and then ask you to answer them. And maybe wherever Matt can come in. Absolutely. You're yeah. also welcome. Okay, so Kachisa, you're the first.